but maybe Marina to bring you into this conversation. I mean, the theme really so far has been around inflation. We're talking about labor shortages having significant knock-on effects to keeping wage pressures elevated. From your seat at Schroeder's as head of sustainability, there's a confluence of factors, but the transition to a low carbon economy is often deemed to be inflationary. How are you seeing investors position for this type of environment from a sustainable lens? Yeah, thank you. Actually, I got the demographics and the deglobalization bit too, but uh, certainly decarbonization as a trend, those are all long-term trends in our view. All of those things are really inflationary and they make up actually the 3D framework that were, sounds like similar to BlackRock's, we call it the 3D reset, which is a decarbonization, deglobalization, demographic shift. So we've moved, we believe, from kind of the nice era, like it was nice while it lasted. It's the non-inflationary, consistently expansionary 40 years. Um, no more of that. Uh, it's much harder going forward. And I would say the kind of implications of decarbonization, ultimately it's the cost of innovation. It's sort of scaling up, you know, uh, clean energy technologies. There's the issue of minerals and rare metal scarcity. Um, and there's the kind of role of government to drive inflation um, you know, government policies basically around decarbonization doing that. So, um, again, to kind of tick through them, there's the cost of experimenting and exploration that encourages technological innovation. Um, there's the issue of higher carbon pricing. We talk about fossil inflation. People like to make up <laughs> words. Um, you know, very hard to escape that at the front end of the energy transition. You have kind of stricter, you know, carbon pricing impacts on both energy prices and electricity prices. Um, then, again, we said these technologies are dependent on mineral and rare earth uh, metals, um, and there's only so much of that to go around, and so you have the issue of scarcity and companies kind of competing for access. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those metals are located in China, so that goes to that question of decoupling and to so those supply chains. So that's kind of a fraught issue. And then, you know, the supply of renewables, you know, kind of um, the U.S. is really focused on increasing the supply of renewables rather through fiscal spending. Um, so and then putting a price on pollution, again, you're kind of seeing that in sort of different parts of the world. And so it really is intertwined, I think, with, with that sort of um, you know, inflationary pressure. Um, and then again, it's exacerbated by the, the issue of sort of reshoring supply chains, the cost of that, and then the issue of demographics and the kind of supply you know, of, of labor and the wages. And so all of those things are very kind of run through with sustainability about how companies are going to respond to those things. But it aggregated all points to, I think, an extended inflationary environment. So, Yeshim, I want to bring you back into the conversation because I think it was you who said that, you know, you could have counter, like, offsetting forces, right? Demographics could be seen potentially as disinflationary, whereas we have others, as Marina mentioned, given the supply shortages and some of the crucial inputs into the transition to net zero, those are inflationary. How, at principle, do you kind of decipher between what the net impact of that could be and how do you position portfolios accordingly looking at the cyclical versus secular? Yeah, well, I, it's, it's a complex issue, right? Uh, <laughs> that um, especially these secular trends are um, sometimes slow moving. I've been in the industry for 20 years. We've been talking about aging populations, unsustainable amounts of debt, and is social security even sustainable? And, a lot of these things have been at play and have been slow moving. So, so I think uh, from a more a PM perspective, how do you decouple what's secular and what's cyclical is important. But let me focus on the secular aspects first. Um, if you think about the drivers, and I think we have a very able panel to talk about the drivers and the three Ds, I wanna talk about a P that we haven't touched on yet, which is productivity. Right, so if you think about demographics, um, you know, a lot of people agree that uh, that's potentially um, inflationary as we have lab shortages in, in labor supply, right? Um, you know, the other, you know, obviously deglobalization, we've been eating the fruits of, you know, globalization, lower uh, production costs and offshoring and, and the peace dividend, some people call, right? So we had an extended period of, um, relatively without world wars and, you know, and, and pretty reasonably stable geopolitical environment, which hopefully remains, that's all our base case, uh, but obviously tensions are brewing in multiple locations in, in terms of geopolitical tensions, and, and therefore people want to, uh, you know, bring to safer shores and have, have more control over their supply chains and so forth. So 
that's clearly you know another inflationary force, um, and uh, you know and debt right so amounts are increasing so that's kind of inflationary so to me the biggest to us the biggest wild card is productivity and the um, what what does technology bring in the earlier sessions we talked about AI. Uh, right, and there is a, a time lag between when you kind of have this new innovator techniques and when it actually gets into the real economy, right? So there are lags on that. But it does feel real that we are seeing, you know, productivity gains or the innings, early innings of productivity gains um, uh, due to technological innovation. So there's so much, I mean, we're in asset management, right? So there are so many inefficiencies in our operational infrastructure. What, what needs to be done manually, for God's sake, at this day and age? My boys, I have teenagers, are like, you guys are dinosaurs. Like, this is all, like, you should be able to do it on your phone and stuff like that, right? So there's a ton of, like, actually uh, inefficiencies that can be really, um, you know, um, cleaned up. And, and, and even in the coding space, I, then I, meant I have a quant background as well, and I have a quant team, and we can use some of these new techniques and reduce our programming time by 20, 25%, and we're starting to do that, right? So think about all these things. So to me, the biggest wild card, and for economists, um, uh, being an economist by training, the most difficult thing to actually model is the impact of technology on productivity. It's a very hard thing to crack. And to me, that is the hope we all have, whether regarding climate change or aging populations. If we can be much more efficient, if we can increase our productivity, to us, that's something to watch very closely in terms of secular trends that can be very deflationary. Think about the last time you bought a, you know, a TV, TV, right? So five years later, the cost is a half or a quarter of what it used to be. So there, Technology can be very deflationary. It can really have positive productivity impacts. So we're excited about that um, and its implications on a secular basis um, and something we're watching very closely 